Okay. Uh, today's speaker, Professor Michael Henning, obtained his doctoral degree in mathematics in 1989 from the then University of Natal, Durban, and joined the University of Johannesburg in 2010. His main area of research is in the field of graph theory and hypergraph theory. Professor Henning has published more than 500 publications to date, uh, the majority of which are on the topic of domination theory and graphs, and he serves on the editorial boards of several prominent journals. He also holds an NRFA1 rating, and he joins us today to present his work on upper bounds on the domination and total domination numbers of a graph in terms of minimum degree. Um, Prof, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Diane, um, and welcome to all those who have joined us. Hope you can all hear me. So I'm going to just present a, a bit of a survey on my favorite topic is that's in domination theory and graphs. And I'm just focusing on, on two parameters, the domination number and total domination number. So again, as Diane said, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I will try and stick to the time. Um, so let me start off with a few definitions. You may be familiar with these, but let's, let's go ahead with them. So we have a graph, vertex set V and edge set E, and what we're interested in is a subset of vertices so that everybody has a neighbor in the set. In other words, everybody not in the set S must be joined by an edge to somebody in the set. It's a dominating set, and we normally looking at a um, the minimum cardinality of such a set, which we call the domination number. So it's gamma G is just gonna be the minimum number of vertices so that everybody outside the set is adjacent to someone in the set. So here's an example. Here's the generalized Peterson graph. Now the set S, in this case, I've colored blue. There's four blue vertices and they form a dominating set because everybody who's not colored blue, everyone outside the set, has at least one blue neighbor. Let's take this black vertex. It has, everyone has a blue neighbor. So that's a dominating set. And you can't do any better in this case. Every vertex dominates four, including themselves. There's 16 vertices. The best you can do is four. Uh, there's the, the foundations of domination. There was a book in 19, I think it was 97. And it's a bit outdated. So recently we ventured in a project. So Teresa Hayes, Steve Eddie, and myself, We've got two books out, one this year, one last year. Uh, these from, are from experts all over the world. And the third part of the volume is on core domination parameters. And that will hopefully be coming out into this year. Um, then the other parameter I want to talk about is the total domination number. Very similar, except you've got the added constraint that your dominating set has the property that everybody in the dominating set must also have a neighbor in the set. In other words, set S is a total dominating set if every vertex is adjacent to a vertex in the set S. So everybody has a neighbor in the set, even if you're in the set. So let's say it's a committee, not only must you know somebody on the committee, but everybody on the committee must at least have some other one on the committee in your faculty that you can work with. Total domination number is the minimum cardinality of a total dominating set. So as an example, again, here's your generalized Peterson, but now instead of needing four to dominate, we've got eight. In fact, these eight blue vertices, if it comes out on your screen, they form a total dominating set because everybody has a blue neighbor. If you're outside the set, if you're a black vertex, you have a blue neighbor. And if you're in the set, well, in fact, you've got two blue neighbors, but you need at least one. So this, and you cannot do any better. You need at least eight vertices to form a dominating, a total dominating set. So these are the parameters I want to look at, and I'm interested in bounds. It's computationally difficult to, to compute the, the domination number and the total domination number. So we try and get bounds on these parameters. So here's a, a book I did in 2013 with Anders Yo just on total domination. And I'm gonna be mentioning some of the results in this talk. So let's start off in the beginning. In the beginning, uh, Ernie Cocaine, Dawes, and Steve Edith Nimi, some 40 so years ago, proved that 
in a connected graph, your total domination number is at most two thirds the order. And surprisingly, it took 20 years before they could characterize those graphs. And they showed that to achieve equality, there's two exceptional ones, a three cycle and a six cycle, but the only other family that achieve equality are what we call the two corona of a graph. So you give me your favorite connected graph and you attach to it paths of length two. Now, if you look at this graph, let's color a subset blue so that everybody has a blue neighbor. If you look at these degree one vertices or a leaf, it has to have a blue neighbor. So all these support vertices, these vertices degree two, have to be in your set. But every support vertex itself needs a blue neighbor. So from every unit of three, you need at least two in the total dominating set. And you need at most, that gives you two, it's at least two thirds, at the most two thirds, it's exactly two thirds. So that's the extreme one. If you impose the degree condition, minimum degree at least two, then I could do slightly better in the old results. I could show that if you exclude a few small graphs, six graphs that you can exclude, then you can drop the two thirds to four sevenths as an upper bound on the total domination. And the quality occurs if and only if it's a 14 cycle or it belongs to this family. And this family is, it's what we call the washing line. You, you pick your favorite graph F and for every vertex in F, you do the following. You add a vertex disjoint six cycle and you join that vertex to one vertex of the six cycle or you pick two non-adjacent vertices, well, a distance two apart in the six cycle, and you join those to that vertex of F. So you've got these units of seven vertices. And in every total dominating set, which we'll represent by a set of blue vertices, you have to color at least four vertices blue in every unit. You can prove that. So you need at least four sevens, but we've proven you need most four sevens. This infinite family gives you equality. If you impose a degree condition of at least three, then you get a very interesting and neat result by Dan Archdeacon and a big group of them. There were some Chinese, there was Israelis, there was some French, Canadian. They combined forces and they showed that you can get a half the order if the minimum degree is at least three. If every vertex has at least three neighbors. And they used, um, very elegant graph theory techniques, including uh, Brooks, Brooks's coloring theorem. A few years later, we, Anders and myself, characterized the extremal ones. So those graphs that achieve equality have to be cubic. In other words, every vertex has degree three. Furthermore, it's one of, it's one of two families or an exceptional graph. Now, the two families that I've called G cubic and H cubic, I'm going to show in a moment. Or it's this exceptional graph I showed you. This generalized Peters graph we saw earlier needs exactly half to totally dominate. But these two families are like, it's, it's a ladder structure. You've got this infinite ladder congruent to zero mod four, and the beams all crisscross, except the top and the bottom rungs of the ladder. You've got a bottom rung and a top rung, or you could replace the top and bottom rung by this rung right from the bottom to the top, bottom, top, uh, right to bottom to top, right over there. That's the only time you're going to need half. You cannot get by with fewer to totally dominate. Then for minimum degree at least four, this was a breakthrough paper by Stefan Thomas from France and Anders Jo. He's, uh, he's Danish, although he was born in Australia but we won't hold that against him. And they proved that you can get a three sevenths bound. You can drop from a half to three sevenths if the minimum degree is at least four. And a few years later, Anders proved that the only way you're going to get equality is if it's the bipartite complement to the Heward graph. Now, just to remind you, the Heward graph is, it's the unique graph, cubic graph, of girth six. In other words, there's no three, four, five cycle. The smallest cycle is a six cycle and it's the smallest order such a graph, it's order 14. Now this graph's bipartite. 
And I've colored the vertices red and blue, and every edge joins a red and a blue vertex. Now, to get the bipartite complement, what you do is you add all the missing edges between the red and blue vertices. So you exactly the same vertex set, but every red vertex is joined to all the blue vertices that it's not adjacent to. And this gives you the bipartite complement. And that graph needs exactly three sevenths of the order. There's 14 vertices. You need six. It's, it's a four regular graph. You need six to totally dominate. So the bound of Thomas and Yeo is best possible. They then, so there's Stefan Thomas from France on the left. There's Anders on the right. He was but interest for interest. He was one of the top squash players in the world. Uh, but their paper was a breakthrough paper because they introduced this transition from total domination to hypergraphs. So let me just briefly mention that. I, I know a lot of you are familiar with it. So what they did is the following. A hypergraph is just an extension of a graph. You've got vertices and you've got edges. But unlike a graph, the edges are two element sets of vertices. Every edge joins two vertices. In a hypergraph, the edges are an arbitrary subset of vertices. You could have three, four, five element sets. And a graph, hypergraph is k-uniform if every edge is size k. So a two-uniform hypergraph is exactly a graph. Every edge consists of two element subset of vertices. And what we're interested in is a transversal. It's a set of vertices that cover all the edges what the graph theorists call a vertex cover, the Hungarians call it a transversal, the computer scientists who are more aggressive call it a hitting set. You've got to hit every edge. And um, the transversal number is the minimum number of vertices that in a transversal. So as a small example, let's take this hypergraph, five vertices, three hyper edges, two edges of order of size three, one of order four, it's often difficult to draw these type of graphs, it gets so messy, but you want to find a subset of vertices that cover the edges. Now, if you pick any one vertex, you're gonna miss an edge. If I pick X, for example, I will miss the edge UVW. If you pick U, you'll miss the four edge, V, Y, W, uh, X, Y, W, V, et cetera. So you need two. So that's your transversal number. And here's another example. There's a three uniform hypergraph. Every high page contains three vertices. You need four. You can prove that if you want to cover all the edges, you need four. Transverse numbers four. And then what Thomas and Yeo did is the following. And again, you may be familiar with this, is given a graph, you look at the open A with a hypergraph. It's defined as follows, exactly the same vertex set as G. But the edges in the open A with a hypergraph are the neighborhoods of vertices in G. So for every vertex in G, you look at its neighbors and you put a hyper edge around its neighbors and that forms the edge in the open neighbor hypergraph. So if G has N vertices, the open neighbor hypergraph has N vertices and N edges. Each edge corresponds to a vertex of G, its open neighborhood. So that's what it is. So let me give you a quick example and then I'll carry on. So for example, if I give this generalized Peterson, it's very easy to find the open neighbor. You just name the vertices. In this case, it's bipartite. So let's just, to make it easier, color the vertices red and blue in the partite sets. When you form your open neighbor to hypergraph, it's exactly the same vertex set. The X1 through to X8, Y1 through to Y8. But for each vertex, let's take X1, you look at its neighbors, x2, x4, and x6, and you're going to put a hyper edge around its neighbors. You do that for each of the 16 vertices, and you will construct an open neighborhood that is, in this case, disconnected, because it's this is bipartite. That's your open neighborhood hypergraph. So this edge, y2, y4, y6, was exactly the neighborhood of x1, etc. Then you take a transversal. You cover all the edges. You undo, what is, the, what is that transverse? Well, let's look at what those vertices are. And then you go back to the graph theory, and these vertices belong to every open neighborhood. 
Therefore, they form a total dominating set because every vertex in the original graph is adjacent to at least one of these vertex because they cover all the hype edges. So when you go back to the graph, these vertices that I've labeled, these eight vertices form a total dominating set. And then you get your total domination number. So you've got this interplay. And what they observed in this key paper of this is that the total domination of a graph is exactly the transversal number of the open neighborhood hype graph. And using this, they could prove their results. So for example, let's take this, this Heward graph. You can work out the total domination number just by purely graph theory, or you could simply look at the open neighborhood hypergraph. And in this case, again, because it's bipartite, your open neighborhood hypergraph is disconnected with two components. In this case, two Fano planes. So these two Fano planes, this is exactly the open neighborhood hypergraph. To find a, a transversal in the Fano plane, to cover all the edges, you need you need three vertices. In fact, any edge, you pick one, two, and four, for example, and let's say B, C, and G, you need three from each. So your transversal number of the open A hypergraph is six. And that's exactly the total domination number that he would graph. It's exactly the same. So it's just an interplay, but the power of this technique is that you go from the graph theory to the open A hypergraph. Open neighborhood hypergraphs are a small subset of the bigger family of hypergraphs. You then prove the results using general hypergraph techniques, which is much easier than graph theory because you can use very strong inductive arguments. You then go back to the open neighborhood hypergraph and then back to the graph theory. So it's just a very powerful technique they introduced. Now, in their paper, they conjecture that minimum degree at least five you should be able to get 411s. That was their conjecture. So we tried for many years, and the best we could do, I, I worked on it with Michael Dorfling, and a couple of people worked on it, but the best result we have to date is 411s plus a little bit, just, just less than 11 over 800. That's the best we can do this using independence and hypergraphs. But we cannot prove this conjecture at the moment. So let me come back to this shortly, this conjecture they posed, if it's true, it's best possible, because for those number theorists amongst us, what they did is the following. They look at the set of non-zero quadratic residues modulo 11. So for the number theorists, that's just the set 1, 3, 4, 5, 9. They construct a hypergraph of 11 vertices. The vertex set is 0, 1 through to 11. And the edge set would consist of 11 edges that are taken from Q just by shifting it by I. In other words, your vertex set is 11 vertices. They name the vertices 0, 1 through to 10. You've got 11 edges. The ith edge is Q plus I. So what you get is a hypergraph on 11 vertices. That's five uniform, five regular. They then take the incidence bipartite graph of this hypergraph. So in other words, you've got two partite sets, X and Y. X would be the vertices of H. Y would be the vertices in Y correspond to the edges of H. And you join a vertex next to a vertex in Y if the corresponding vertex in the hypergraph H is contained in the hyper edge corresponding to the vertex in Y. And if you do that, you're going to get a bipartite graph of order 22. And that graph looks like this. And it needs exactly eight vertices. It needs four elevens to the vertices. It's five regular. So if their conjecture is correct, that minimum degree at least five, the total domination number is at most four elevens. If it's true, you cannot do any better because of this construction given by Thomas and Yeo. Now, as I said, we couldn't prove it. So what we did is we thought, okay, let's, let's relax the degree condition. What if you have minimum degree at least six. Can we then at least prove the Thomas Yeo conjecture? In other words, if a minimum degree, if every vertex has at least six neighbors, can we prove the total domination numbers at most the conjecture bound of four limits? So that's what Anders and I worked on. And essentially the problem is the following. You want to show that for a six uniform hypergraph, the transversal number is two elevenths the order plus size. 
Because when you go from the graph theory to open data hypergraph, your open data hypergraph, the, the size is exactly n. And this will give you the 411s bound. So to prove this result, what we did is the following. We look at all the vertices in H of degree i. Let's call those ni. And I'm going to let n at least four be the number of vertices of degree at least four in H. So it could have degree. So if it's got degree six, that means it's contained in six distinct edges. The problem then becomes a linear programming problem. You've got a six uniform hypergraph H and you're given that x5, we don't know what that is, times the transversal number is at most this expression where every vertex of degree one has a certain weight. And the vertices of degree at least four and the number of edges have the same weight, x4. And you want to minimize this quantity, x4 of x5. And you've got a whole lot of constraints. And as the proof goes on, the, the hypergraph proof, more and more constraints come in and this gives rise to a linear programming problem. Essentially, you've got to minimize some function involving x1, x2. You've got a whole lot of constraints and a couple of more. But this all comes out from the proof. And with this interplay of, of optimization and the hypergraph and induction techniques, you can solve this problem and get this result, which reduces to the following. So this right-hand expression is at most 7707 times the order. And this will give you the bound that we would like. Well, this gives us this bound. And then using the interplay of, of hypergraphs and graphs, this gives us the result that we wanted. It gives us the bound of just less than four levels, but only by a little bit. So what we have shown here is that the Thomas EO bound certainly holds if minimum degrees at least six. In fact, it holds restriction equality. So here's a summary, but the, the thing is this bound we think is very far from optimal. We, we can't do any better at this point. Uh, we have ideas, but we haven't proven it yet. But our conjecture is that this should be 4 13 And again, the construction is for the number theorists is you take the, the non-zero quadratic residues modulo 13. In other words, you, you take the set 1, 3, 4, 9, 10, 12. You construct a hypergraph of order 13, a six uniform hypergraph. So let's label the vertices 0, 1 through 12. You've got 13 hyper edges. The ith hyper edge is Q shifted by I. So you're going to construct a, a, a six regular, six uniform hypergraph on 13 vertices. You take the incidence by apartheid graph, and that gives you the following graph. Now that graph is six regular. It needs eight vertices to totally dominate. It needs exactly four thirteenths order. So if the conjecture bound is correct, it's best possible. But again, th this we quite far from, from proving we can do better than four elevens using some other techniques we're working on, but this is slope. So just to summarize the total domination results to date, so going back to 1980, minimum degree one, you got two thirds order. In 2000, I could prove the four sevens. 2004, they could improve a half n. These three bounds are all tight in the sense that there's infinite families. Then it gets more complex. Minimum degree is four. Thomas and Yo proved the three sevens bound, only achieved by the bipartite by complement of the, of the Heward graph. Minimum degree five. Conjectured bound is 411s, still open. We can get close to 411s, but not, we're not there. Minimum degree at least six. Well, we can definitely do 411s. We think it's 413s, but we're quite far from them. For large minimum degree, I'm talking about quite large, it's easy. Just use, use, use probabilistic methods. We know it's essentially one plus log delta over delta times the order. But the challenge is for small minimum degree. Let's say minimum degree less than order 100. So that's the a summary of, of total domination. Just on bounds that I'm interested, I mean, there's many other nice results, but I'm just looking at bounds in today's talk. So these last few results, I said this minimum release five is 2016, this is 2021, the last one. Let's now shift to domination. 
So this goes right back to 1962. Uh, I was only a year or two old at that point. But anyway, he proved that for domination number, it's a half order. Very easy proof. Surprisingly, it took 20 years before they characterized the extremer ones. I don't know why, because it's a very simple proof that it's a half the order for domination, if not if it's a four cycle, or the corona of a graph. Now, the corona of a graph is very simple. You take your favorite graph and you just add a pendant edge to each vertex. And to dominate, now remember to dominate. All you're requiring is a set of blue vertices that everybody not colored blue, everyone outside the set has a blue neighbor. And clearly from every pendant edge, you need to pick one of the vertices. Otherwise, the degree one won't be dominated. So this was the, the first result, this got a game. Then in 1973, a Russian blank published this paper, but he didn't use domination, he used, I think it was, coefficient of external stability, and it was in Russian, and it was difficult to find, but he proved this result that if the minimum degree is at least two, and you exclude a few small graphs, the domination of it can be improved from a half to two fifths. This was reproved in 1989 by McCraig Shepard. They gave a beautiful proof, and this proof gives a lot of insight because it gives us the extremal graphs. So let me show you the structure of the extremal graphs. What they did is, if you exclude seven little exceptional ones, so these seven exceptional ones, one of order four, there's six of order seven that need three to dominate. I've indicated in blue. If you exclude these seven exceptional ones, the bound is two fifths. So if you, if you exclude these bad ones, it's two fifths. The extremal ones are the following. They must belong to this family G dom, which is very easy to construct. What they did is the following. You look at a unit. A unit could be a four cycle with a pendant edge or a five cycle. And in each unit, you do the following. If it's a four cycle with a pendant edge, they call it a key, the degree one vertex you call the link vertex. And I'm going to color it black. In every five cycle, you pick two non-adjacent vertices. You pick any two and you identify them as the link vertices. You color those black. Then you add any number of edges joining these link vertices, any way you want. Like this is an example. And what you will get is a graph in your family. And you've got units of order five. And in every unit of five vertices, you need two to dominate. You can show it if you could pick a subset of blue vertices, so everyone has a blue neighbor, Every unit of five needs at least two. Your domination number is at least two fifths, but it's at most two fifths. It's exactly two fifths. So this is what they did. You again, you could pick there's some units, pick any number of edges you want joining joining the link vertices. It could even be two connected, as we see. So just to mention that their proof technique uses. A very simple strategy of edge minimal graphs, a very, very powerful strategy. A graph would be edge minimal, two fifths edge minimal, if the minimum degree is at least two, must be connected, and the domination number is at least two fifths. So you pick a graph of minimum degree at least two, you remove edges until you construct a two fifths minimal graph. So any edge you remove will either drop the minimum degree disconnect the graph or drop the domination. Then you can you can prove the reason for two first minimal graphs, they then characterize them. And from that result, they can deduce their main result. So that was the idea. Then for minimum degree at least three, there's this significant result by Reed dating back to 1996. And he showed that you can improve the two fifths bound to three eighths. Um, and it's sharp because if you take, so let's take, if you look at each of these units I've drawn at the bottom, this is a non planar graph of order eight, a cubic graph of order eight. And I've just added edges joining these so called link vertices, but you've got, you've got these units of order eight. And again, you can easily show that every unit needs at least three vertices to dominate. If you, if you look color of a subset of vertices blue and you want everyone to have a blue neighbor, 
you will have to color at least three vertices blue in every unit. The interesting thing is that his proof technique uses very intricate combinatorial arguments. It's used what's called a vertex disjoint path color. So what he does, he wants, he takes a graph minimum degree of these three, and he wants to cover the vertices with the minimum number of paths. And he defines some concepts like an out in vertex of a path. It's end of a path that's adjacent to something outside the path. And he looks at three types of paths, depending if they're congruent to zero, one, or two mod three. And he calls those an I path. And then he looks at a, a, a VDP cover would be a set, and every element of S is a set of I paths. And he chooses this cover very, very carefully. What he does, he chooses it subject to a whole lot of conditions. The number of paths in your set must be minimized. Subject to that, if you look at the number of one paths, you know, times two plus number two paths, that's minimized. And subject to that, there's a whole lot of constraints. And with all these conditions, he uses optimization techniques and he proves the results. Very powerful, intricate technique. And he gets this result of three eighths order. As an immediate consequence, you get that if it's a cubic graph, because a cubic graph is degree is three regular, it's certainly minimum degree three, he gets three eights. But for cubic, it's a lot more difficult because the infinite example I showed you last in a few slides back has got large degree vertices. But for cubic, there's only two small graphs of that need three eights of order. These two, if you look at the two non-planar cubic graphs of order eight, they need three out of eight, to, they need three vertices to dominate. In 2009, Kostotska and Stotska proved that, that if you exclude these two cubic graphs of reads, you can actually do better, 5 fourteenths. And there are some examples where you need 5 fourteenths, like this particular graph order 14, your domination number is 5, which is 5 fourteenths. But it, this, this proof, again, was over 60 pages, and it became really difficult because we still do not know what is the best possible bound for the domination of a cubic graph. So if you let G n cubic be the family of connected cubic graphs of order n, what we would like to find is what is the supremum of this ratio gamma over n as n tends to infinity. Now from this Kostochka result, we know it's at most five sevenths. There are constructions that show us it's it's fairly big. It's at least a third plus one over 60. But we cannot close the gap. And this has been a 25-year-old problem, is to try and determine what the supreme is. So for a cubic graph, we still don't really understand how this domination number works. It's, it gets extremely complex. So let's go to minimum degree four. Minimum degree four, the Chinese Son and Yuan proved that you can get four elements. They use reads as proof technique, exactly the same proof technique, gets more complex. We cannot improve this bound at this time. We don't know if it's achievable. The best you can hope for is a third, but we're very, very far from that. And there's many graphs where you need a third. The big breakthrough came through as minimum degree five. When Shilla Budkas, a Hungarian mathematician, got this magical one third bound. She proved that the minimum degree is at least five, you can achieve this magical one third bound. But what was so interesting is her proof technique. She no longer used reads vertex to join cover, path cover proof technique. She used an ingenious approach of vertex weighting arguments, a coloring approach, and algorithmic discharging arguments. And I'm gonna mention this a bit later. If I hopefully we get a few minutes, I think I've only got 10 or 11 minutes, so let's see if I can get to it. And um, again, we can't do any better, but this, is a, this was a breakthrough. Going back four years previously, Sandy Klobz, a uh, um, Slovenian graph theorist in Schiller, proved a following astonishing result. They showed a, a general result that if you've got a, a graph minimum degree D, 
And A and S are going to be numbers, real numbers that satisfy the following. It's got a whole lot of inequalities. I'm just going to put them up. If all these are satisfied, then your domination number is at most A over S times N. And as a consequence of this result, they could prove a whole lot of bounds on the domination number. They're the best ones to date for large minimum degree, at least six up to 50. For large minimum degree, 100 or more, we use probabilistic bounds. But for minimum degree 50 and less, their bounds are the best. So what Schiller and I decided to do is, let's go deeper. Let's look at minimum degree at least six. Can we beat this bound of 0.3158929N? So what we did is the following. We showed that we can beat it, but it's a bit of an ugly bound. It's 0.3038 approximately. It's, we were hoping to do the more aesthetically beautiful three tenths bound, but the best we could do is 127 over 480. And our proof is the following, and I'm going to sketch it to you because I've got a few minutes. What we did is, again, we don't know if it's achievable. I mean, it's the best we can absolutely hope for is a quarter N. I mean, for example, there's many, many graphs that are six regular and you need a quarter of the vertices to dominate. But here's another example. Here's a six regular graph. Every vertex has degree six. You need, you need a quarter of the vertices to dominate. So we, we don't have any idea of what the best bound is. We cannot do better than a quarter N. But let me show you our, our proof. What we do is the following. Uh, we, we pick a subset of vertices D and we construct a residual graph by assigning colors to the vertices according to a set of rules. A vertex we color white if it's not dominated. In other words, if V does not belong to the closed neighborhood of D. If a vertex is dominated, we color it blue if it has at least one neighbor not yet dominated. So the blue vertices are dominated, but they have at least one neighbor not yet dominated. The vertex is red if it's it and all its neighbors are dominated. And what we do in the residual graph, the edges joining blue and red vertices are not important. You remove those. So every edge must be instant to a white vertex. So here's an example. Let's take this graph. Now, this set D are these two black vertices. If I do this coloring approach, a vertex will be colored white if it's not dominated, blue if it's dominated by one of these black ones, but has a neighbor not dominated, and red if it and all its neighbors are dominated, you'll get this graph. You color blue, red, and white. You remove edges between blue and red vertices, and you get the residual graph. Now, that's what we're working with. Now, in a residual graph, a red vertex is degree zero. A white vertex could have a very large degree, at least six in this case. Blue vertices could have white degree, because blue vertices only join to white vertices. Now, what we do is the following. Uh, we look at the vertices, the white, blue, and red. Let's call them W, B, and R. The, set, the dominating set D is always a subset of red vertices. And we look at the white degree of a vertex, because in the residual graph, we've only got edges joining white vertices, and the blues only join to white. And what we prove now is the following. And the way we do it is, is as follows. We can assume the graph is edge minimal with respect to minimum degree at least six. So if these two vertices of degree eight, or let's well, say both degree nine, you remove that edge. It's not going to be important. You can reduce the degree until it's edge minimal. And we prove the result for edge minimal, which will immediately imply the result. Then we look at the following. B6 are the blue vertices that have at least six white neighbors. B1 through to B5 are the blue vertices that have exactly I white neighbors. Then we assign a weight to the vertices. If it's red, it's got weight zero, a white vertex, 508, etc. A blue vertex with exactly five white neighbors has a weight of 317.4. The weight of the graph is the sum of the weights of the vertices. So blue vertices, each one contributes 194, etc. Every, every blue vertex with three white neighbors has a contribution of 368. Then we notice that the weight of, I think I've got six minutes, 
the weight of your residual graph is zero if known if these are dominating sets. Now, what we do is the following. We've got a dominating set and we're going to grow it. And when you add to it a set of vertices, the weight decreases because when you add the dominating set and a set A, more vertices get colored red and blue, their weights decrease. Remember, the most expensive weights are, sorry, the white vertices. As, your, as the weights, as you get more vertices colored with, with fewer degrees, the weights decrease. So you get a weight decrease. And what we want to prove is that when you grow the dominating set by adding to it a set D, you want that set to have the property that the weight decrease must be at least 1,672 times the cardinality of A. That'll be a D desirable set. And the key proof, we have, key lemma we have here is that you can always find it. If the weight is positive, if the weight in the residual graph is positive and B6 is empty, which we can assume as a, later on the proof, you can always find a D desirable set that preserves the property that every blue degree vertex has to at most five. And essentially what you do in this proof is a couple of pages work, you can show that the white degrees at most two, the blue degree in the sense that the, every blue vertex will have at most three white neighbors. Then it gets a bit more complex. What you do then is you can show that all the white components, only the white vertices are either P1, P2, C4, C5. And according to the structure of the graph, which I'm not going to define, you, you define these P1, P2s as uncovered or covered. Then you do a little bit of discharging them. This is the complicated part of it. Every vertex has a weight. The, the white components have too small a weight. So you've got to charge the weight of the blue vertices distributed to these white components using set of rules. And I'm not going to go into it, but essentially the way the discharging rules work is the following. You've got these white components, and I haven't explained their structure. They could be uncovered or covered, etc. And according to the discharging, at the end of the discharging argument, these white components must receive this amount of weight. And the rules that we have for discharging will do it, but it's fairly complicated, so I won't go into it. And after the discharging procedure, you can show that there will exist a desirable set, which we said we couldn't exist. So what that means is this key claim says that if the residual weight is positive, you can find, you can add the dominating set of set A, and you can keep on going, and it's desirable. So what this means is that, and I'll close with this, you start off with a graph, everything is colored white. So you've got your graph, it's minimum degree at least six. You color everything white, your initial set D0 is empty, you haven't got a dominating set. So everything is white, every vertex has a weight of 508, because the white vertex is a weight of 508. It's a positive weight, you use this claim, you can find a D0 desirable set. So you can add to this initial set, which is empty, a set A1 that's D desirable. It has cardinality. It's going to decrease the weight by at least 1672 times the cardinality of A1. Then you get a new graph, G1. It's a residual graph. In this residual graph, if the weight is positive, our claim says you can find a D1 desirable set, which will reduce the weight by at least 1672 times A2. And you keep on going. You keep on adding to your dominating set, a, a desirable set. And as you continue the process, you construct these residual graphs, starting with G0, the original graph, then G1, G2 after GK. And you, in each case, you add a set A1, A2 up to AK to the dominating set until your final residual graph is weight zero, which means you've got a dominating set. And in each case, you reduce the weight by 1672 times the cardinality of AR. And this gives you the weight of the original graph G0 is just 508 times the order. And the sum of the AIs is exactly D. And if you just rearrange it, you get then that 
your domination number is at most this set D that you found, which is given by 508 over 1672 or equivalently 127418. So that then proves our bound. So it uses this, this argument of, of, of vertex coloring, it uses um, vertex weighting, it uses very complicated discharge arguments and algorithmic procedures and combinatorial structural arguments, and then we can get our bound. So here's a summary to date of what we know. So going back to 1960, we've got the half end bound. Nine, and then we've got the two fifths bound from 1973. Reed's bound in the 94, 96, sorry, 96 bound. Again, these are all sharp, infinite families. Then you get this four limbs bound. We can't improve it. That's a that's, um, 2009 result. Schiller Budkast last year gave this big breakthrough using showing you get the third bound if minimum is at least five. Again, we don't know if we can do better. Best we can hope for is a quarter n. Best we can hope for is a third n. Minimum degree six. Um, again, the best, what we've proven today is the best possible bound, which is a quarter plus a bit. And this is the best bound. Again, the, the arguments are, are fairly intricate. For minimum degree three and four, you use Reed's uh, ingenious vertex to joint path cover. Two fifths use the edge minimality. One third, you use Butkus's um, vertex coloring and, and discharging and uh, arguments. And when degree six, we've also used our argument. So this then is a summary of what we know to date in the bounds. Again, for, for large minimum degree, it's just simple. Use probabilistic methods, minimum degree at least 100 or more. We know exactly what happens. But for small minimum degree, less than 100, the, the smaller the minimum degree, it becomes fairly complex. So I think, let me stop there. I've got one minute over. So that's just a, a summary of what what's we know about bounds on domination and total domination um, in terms of the order. So that's all I've done today, just present a bit of a summary of these results. So let me stop sharing and then you can ask questions. Uh, so let me stop sharing or should I keep sharing? Hi, oh, Prof. Um, yeah, keep sharing if you don't mind, just in case someone wants to refer to a specific slide, if that's okay. Um, so yeah, thank you so much um, for a really, you know, you, I know you said it was an overview, but um, quite a quite a constructive and in-depth overview um, of, of domination. And I'd very much like to uh, turn to our audience now and invite questions um, or indeed comments from our audience. Um, I'm just going to check the chat. So no one's posted anything in the chat yet, um, but I'd like to ask people to feel free just to um, come forward. All they need to need do is unmute their microphone um, and I'll be able to call on them. Um, and yeah, just to come forward with their questions or comments. Um, just while we're waiting, Prof, you referred to um, one of your books earlier. Yes. I don't know if you wouldn't mind just going back to that. Um, I, think, I don't want to call it a reference. A but a, these are yeah. Ones, these are ones on, well, this is, you know, there's what they call the Domination Bible in 1997 or 1998. Uh, Haynes Hedden even Slater wrote the Domination books. But they're really outdated. So we've now got a three volume set. The first, these, these topics was an edited one. So we got about 20 contributions from people all over the world. And the second volume structures is also contributions on structures of graph theory. And the third one is not yet out, but that's gonna just be focused on domination, gamma, total domination, independent domination. So that's the aim of it is that, um, is we got this three volume series coming out. The third one is just Teresa and Stephen Hedden myself about a 700 page book just on these three parameters and hopefully by the end of the year it'll be out. The one on total domination with Anders, that's a smaller book, maybe 220 pages. It came out in 2013. Um, so those are sort of some of the fundamentals that we've got. Again, it's not comprehensive at all. 
I mean, there's some 6,000 papers on domination theory and graphs, so we, we cannot be comprehensive, but I, that's, but I think we've, um, we've tried to at least do the foundations and sort of up to date. Um, so in the, yeah, so that, that's, that's essentially some of the, the background on domination theory, if people are interested in getting into it. Right, yeah, I mean, 6,000 papers is, is quite prolific. You know, it's it's good to yeah. know. Um, yeah, I mean, just to echo one of our um, post-grad uh, awarded um, students, Madeleine von Straatsen, she's just written, thank you for a very interesting and clear talk. And I think that's definitely something that struck me today as well as the clarity of what you were presenting. Um, which is always refreshing with with something that's quite research intensive, um, you know, to a general public point of view as well as a mathematical or statistical point of view. Um, I've got a, a, we, can't, we can't go into any proof technique. I mean, I, I did a sketch of the proof, but I, just to give you a flavour of it. Um, so I haven't really presented any any tools to use, but it's just a, just a flavour of it. Yeah, no, and it was it was definitely a like I said, just a really great overview. I mean, I call it an overview. I think probably the word flavor is better <laughs> that you've chosen. Um, Andrew Craig from UJ's got his hand raised. Andrew. Okay, perfect. Hi, Mike. Um, Hi, there, so, Andrew. With the with the sort of um, with each step, it seems like a new proof technique has to be developed for for each number. Did, does that mean that that people only? I mean, are, is is there a kind of an an arms? Yes. Does everyone know what everyone else is is developing? Um, pretty much. Let me, that's a very good point. Let's take the total domination. So yeah, I need to go out and just purely graph theory. Yeah, there's four sevens. I I use the same approaches as Bruce as um with Craig Shepard. The half end was completely different. You needed vertex coloring arguments, Brooks's theorem. This for total domination, this was the breakthrough. This is where they transition to hypergraphs. And you these results you cannot prove just by purely graph theory. So four, five, and six are okay. This is this is a hypergraph techniques. This uses independence in the hypergraphs, but this minimum degree six one, we also use a lot of linear programming, and but it's essentially hypergraph techniques. If you go to the domination, we go right to the end of the domination one. So just where's the summary I had. Um, so as you said, Andrew, this is the half end is just purely graph theory properties. Two fifths is this edge minimal property, which is very nice. Three fifths with this vertex disjoint path cover, ingenious argument with the way he chooses this path cover is just phenomenal. Four elevenths, exactly the same technique. We've tried the, the Butchess's approach. The, the vertex coloring, you get exactly the same bound. We can't improve it. You need a, you need a new technique here. And this method last year of, of Butkash is a huge breakthrough because of the, this discharging vertex coloring algorithmic argument she gives and that I've also used with on this paper. It's just a completely different technique to read one. To read one from 1996, this, this three eighth bound, we had no new technique until last year of Butkash. So maybe there are other techniques out there, which we're going to need because we've tried to milk this as much as we can. So one definitely needs more techniques, but um, as you said, the, um, some of the techniques like Bukas's vertex coloring technique is not very effective for minimum degree three. It's not, not good at all, but as soon as the minimum degree gets a bit larger, her technique is extremely powerful. So some of the techniques that are powerful for small minimum degree are completely useless for large minimum degree. Some of the techniques for large minimum degree are inadequate for small minimum degree. So you're quite right, and you almost need, the larger minimum degree gets, you need new techniques. So at the moment, yeah, it's a mixture of, um, you know, all sorts of combinations you've got with discharging, vertex coloring, you've got residual graphs, you've got those sort of things. But you just need more techniques. You need uh, you need some clever ideas to try and make progress. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, okay, we've got a couple of minutes left, so I just want to call on um, anyone else to come forward with a question or comment. 
Um, Prof, I know you said you were um, that you might leave some stuff out just just because of time time factors. Um, so if we don't have any other uh, questions or comments at this point, um, I just want to ask if there's anything you'd like to add. No, I don't think so. I died because I was going to go into more detail on the proof of this. This one, but I just wanted to give a flavour. For example, when I reduced to those white components, it was different depending on the structure, how the blue vertices are joined, the white ones. You get these different types of components, and that affects the discharging arguments. But I don't want to get into it because it is fairly complex. So the idea was simply that it's just the three colouring: the red, blue, white vertices. You you remove edges joining blue and red, you simplify the graph, uh, you've got weights for the vertices, and each time the weight reduces, and if you can get this, um, you know, this, this, this extendable set that reduces the weight by a certain amount, that's your aim. And that's how we derive the original weights. We've, we've got to try and optimize it in such a way that we can achieve this target of, of every time we add the dominating set, the weight drops by the, the amount that we desire. And then we can get our bound out. So I just wanted to get that flavor in, but I, I just couldn't go through any proof in detail. So I think I'm happy just with the basic flavor of the proofs that are presented there. So, I, so I'm fine, and I think I'll, I'll stop there. Oh, no, that's great, Prof. Thank you. Um, you know, something that I always ask um, our presenters, particularly when there's a little bit more detail that could be gone into, is if you're happy for any of our audience members to contact you via email. Um, you know, if they should think up anything sort of after the after the presentation, um, or perhaps watching the recording, um, because we did include your email address on our on our poster that went out sort of earlier this week. Um, so if you're happy, you know, for me to sort of advertise that. Yes, perfectly fine. I can give the references for these. And as I said in the book, it's coming out, all these bounds that I've mentioned on gamma, on total domination, and these on independent domination, I haven't mentioned that. It's about a 100-page chapter on all these bounds. So what I've summarized today is just um, sort of that 100-page chapter we've got, chapter seven in our book, in our book that's coming out. But I do have the references for all the individual papers if they, if they would like it. But um, to get the overview, I said in, in the book it's coming out, we've tried to present the proof, the proof details of these. So... This is just one of the 20 chapters. This is the chapter on bounds. There's 19 other chapters in the book on other structural properties and you know, forbidden cycles or criticality aspects or graph products. But this is just one chapter of the, the book that I've, I've discussed today. I just find the bounds interesting. So that's why I've just focused on this topic. Um, but for sure, they're welcome to contact me. I can give them the references and... Um, and uh, yeah, that, that'll, that'll be great. That's wonderful, Prof. Yeah. And, and you know, you talk about presenting what, what fascinates you and what interests you, and that definitely comes across in your presentation. So um, I think everyone loves talking about their passions. So it's, it's really nice. Um, so Prof, again, you know, on behalf of the center, as well as the audience, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and best of luck with your research going forward. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to give a talk. And thank you for everyone listening and taking time out of your schedules. So I really appreciate everyone just taking part today and listening. So thanks again, Diane. Thanks very much, Prof.